What's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to What's in Your Glass. I'm, I'm your host, Carmelo Anthony. Uh, before we get going, I, let's let's first welcome today's guest. Uh, we all know him, or you know him, as, as the New York Times bestselling author uh, for his memoir, How to Be Black, uh, and and as the host of the of, of the podcast, How to Citizen, uh, which was just named. Congratulations, first uh, was just named last year as one of the Apple's best of 2020. Uh, but we'll we'll get into all of that and then much more. But first, please let's welcome to the show writer, activist, comedian, Baratunde. And did I did I did I get it right? Did I get the name right? Well, you did pretty good. You did pretty good. Uh, Tunde Bar or Tunde? Tunde. Baratunde. Tunde. Bar yeah. Tunde. Okay. Together we are Mellow Tunde. Boom. Oh, Mel Mellow Tunde. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers to Mellow Tunde for sure. <laughs> Cheers to you, Carmelo. Cheers. Likewise, right. my brother. What you drinking actually? What's in your glass? Oh. Mm. I am drinking a fine blend. This is uh, Brown Estate Chaos oh. Theory 2019. It's got a little bit of everything in it, um, kind of like black folks. <laughs> and and I, I came across this vineyard. I was going to Napa for the first to only time in my life with my woman years back and a friend, uh, Dream Hampton, actually, people might know mm -hmm. her. She recommended this vineyard to me because it was like the only black owned vineyard in, in the Napa area. And so she made a nice little email intro. We got there, got the tour, a lot of Zinfandels up in there. Absolutely. Um, it was very beautiful to, uh, we actually joined their club for a while. We would just get a box or a different bottle every month for a minute. Uh, so this is a great excuse to uh, celebrate a good brand. Um, Absolutely. Big shout out to Brown too, for sure. They do a, they do a hell of a job up there. Yeah. What are you drink? What's in your glass? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing a blind tasting today. So I really don't know. I'm doing a, a real live bl blind tasting. I don't know what I'm drinking. Uh, I, I, I got two bottles downstairs. They blind tasting, and I'm just gonna go with it and see, try to figure it out, and then I'll make the call. Uh, well, as soon as we're done, I'll make the call and try to figure this shit out. So, so what what are you what are you tasting? What is it What does it taste like? I'm tasting. I'm. I mean, of course, you know, like I'm tasting chocolate. It's light. It's a very. It's a very light. It tastes like a Pinot. It could be a Pinot Noir, it could be a lighter burgundy, but I'm, you know, a lot of similarities with that. Um, it's not as, you know, not as peppery as as mm -hmm. as, as wine connoisseurs would say. It's not as peppery. <laughs> it's young, I can tell you that. It's it's yeah. a very young wine. This one I'm drinking is a very young wine. So that was my first my first sip of it. So I'm trying to figure it out. I'll get to it though. I'll I'll, I'll let you know. I'll let you know what it Thank is. Thank you. Keep me posted. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's 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 start from the beginning though. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, growing up in D.C., uh, Washington, D.C., um, you know, I could always ask you, what was it like growing up in D.C.? But what was it like growing up in D.C.? For those, <laughs> <laughs> for those who may for those who may not know D.C., I'm very familiar with D.C. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, for your upbringing and, and, and you growing up in D.C., what was it like? So let me set the time quickly. It was, uh, the year is 1977. I was born in uh, George Washington University Hospital. 7.39 p.m., mm. <laughs> September 11th, uh, to, to my mother, Arnita Lorraine Thurston, uh, and of course to my father, though he wouldn't be around for very long. I have an older sister, Belinda. She arrived in 68, nine years before me. So she got the full dose of Chocolate City, uh, the, the beautiful roller rinks, the discos, <laughs> the, the happy fun times. I came in at the tail end of those happy fun times as the city started to turn. And, and as I started to wake up just being a person in the 80s, things went from happy to a little more twisted, you know, with our mayor, with the drug game, with police, with we were the murder capital during my youth, you know, the nation's capital and the murder capital. Absolutely. So growing up in D.C. was at least like growing up in two worlds. It was growing up in this city that was increasingly under siege and there was just like endangered black man energy all around and adults really worried about me and people like me and my friends and it was mad fun it was beautiful there was a lot of culture the food was great the music's dope um, i felt like the size of the city you could get around i took public transit everywhere we had the, the dope museums the national monuments national parks so i feel like i got to see uh the best and the worst you know coming up in the time that i did i lived in dc uh, in the area, I stayed in the city in Mount Pleasant, Columbia Heights, anybody who knows, uh, until about 89, then Tacoma Park. 
And then I went off to college in 95 and I haven't lived in DC since, though I have visited a lot. Gotcha. And that, like I said, I'm, I'm very familiar with DC and Chocolate City and yeah, man. Just, just, just that, that history. Uh, you know, I was right, right down the block uh, in, in, in Baltimore. So, you know, we, we, we had an insight into what was going on in, in, yeah. in DC during those times. So you, you, you know, growing up in DC, you, you got your degree from Harvard. Um, and, and for those who don't know you, uh, you, you, you have a grandmother uh, who, who was the first black employee uh, at, at the U.S. Supreme Court building. Uh, what would you say, uh, would you say becoming someone who is successful and, and, and known for work at, at the intersection of, of race, technology and, and democracy was a long time coming? <laughs> Everything that I do was a long time coming. You know? <laughs> I mean, because I only am able to do it because a lot of other people did before me. Absolutely. So, you know, my story doesn't start in 77. That's that's when I, my eyes were physically open, but uh, I was brought here like so many of us. And my mother uh, and my father, to some extent, he wasn't around for much, but he contributed to me being here. They laid the path and certainly my, my grandparents. My mom was a computer programmer. My mom was a very political person, you know, when it came to black liberation, Afrocentricness. That's why I have this Nigerian-ish name, Baratunde. It's a Yoruba name, but we're not. Uh, but mm -hmm. she, like a lot of black parents in the 70s, were trying to get back to Africa, couldn't yeah, afford the sure. airfare, you know, so put it on the kid's birth certificate. And, uh, and my grandmother on my father's side is from South Carolina and, and came up fleeing to some degree, the lack of opportunity, the... You know, all the all the wildness that we know about this nation's history is still pretty present. And and she worked in the US information agency. So you got information, you got computer programming, you got politics, just in the mothers that gave birth to my parents. And some of that stayed with me. Some of that stayed with me. And my older sister being a journalist for as long as she was, I don't think I ever was pursuing her path formally, but when I look back, she clearly says some kind of example for me to be playing so much in the world of words like I do. I mean, you, you, I mean, it sounds to me you had a family of stars, but even, even, even before you had a full team, you know what I'm saying? So you, you had an opportunity to yeah. kind of get it from all, you know, all different, different walks of life, all different types of people, all different types of situations. So you were using the, you know, using a melon pot in there. You just had all of this, all of these ingredients before you even knew you had that. And then some of them you discover later, you know, when my father was killed, I lost track of his whole family. I was seven, eight years old. And I didn't really reconnect with them until within the past few years, literally. So the, the formal influence was moms and, and a bit of my older sister. And then the neighborhood. And the neighborhood was very invested. You know, we had people that weren't relatives minding your business and making it <laughs> <For> sure. sure. <laughs> and you know, with all the chaos that started happening on the block, I was also a bit protected. I was, you know, nerdy, academic. And kids weren't really trying to mess with me too much. Like, oh, you, you don't need to be messing with this too much. Man. You go ahead and stick with school. And right. so I had, I had some mentors uh, and some positive influences. Basically, I'm saying I was, I was invested in. I, I think I had a lot going for me, but also had a lot like put in me by all these these other people. Gotcha. And you know, qu questioning, questioning authority, and and, and kind of just yeah. you know, for forging your own path always seems you know integral to, to, to your work, I, I would say. What, what was it about your upbringing that made you want to take on everything that you, that you take on today? Um, my mother had this mantra, question authority, and she even gave it to me as a bumper sticker to put in my, in my locker at school. And I, I used to joke a lot, I'm like she wanted me to question authority except for hers. <laughs> which is a very, you know, parental thing to do. Absolutely. <laughs> you don't take nothing from nobody except for except me. me. I'm putting this roof over your head and this roof in your belly. Like you want to pay rent, start shopping. Um, I have, I have kid. So what made me want to pursue what I do, which is I, I use words on stage, on microphones, on camera to explore some of the harder stuff in society and make it feel a little less hard. And that's race and that's democracy and that's tech which isn't just tech, it's like everything we care about now is filtered through tech um, and increasingly climate. And I think I pursue that because of who brought me into this world. Uh, I think I pursue it because I was born exactly when I was, so I grew up with a computer pretty early and that shaped my world a bit. And then over time, I, I like to think I chose it to some degree. I have fun with it. 
And right. I feel a sense of, uh, I don't know, man, it feels like we're in a, we're in a tight spot. You know, some days I'm just like, we're not going to make it just as a species, you know, as a nation, as a city, whatever level you look at it, it feels like we can barely get our act together. And then other times I remember and I see all this beauty and this inspiration and our ability to kind of overcome like we have before. And that keeps me going. And I want to be a part of that side of it. You know, I don't want to just complain. I don't want to just be sad and angry and depressed, though all those are very justifiable. Um, it's just not quite in my nature to sit still with that. And I try to convert it as best I can for my own survival. And then right. maybe somebody else, you know, get something from it too. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm, I know for a fact, and I'm pretty sure that you know that, that others get a lot from it, from, from you know, you stepping up and being a voice and, you know, speaking on different topics and, and situations, uh, you know, kind of opening those, those, those conversations up for people to have, those uncomfortable conversations, we, yeah. which, which we have to con continue to have and continue to, you know, let people speak and let their voice be heard. So I just want to, I want to say thank you for that. And don't never stop that for sure. Thank um, you. Thank you. And, and, you know, mo moving, we're well, kind of moving on and from 2007 to 12, like you, you were uh, the director of the digital for the onion. Uh, then there's something very similar in supervising for the digital expansion at the, uh, that with Trevor, with one of my good friends, Trevor, yeah. the daily show. The um, big shout out to Trevor for sure. Uh, what, what was it like working for, for both of those, which, which you are, you, you so, uh, such respected institutions that, that you use humor to underscore like what's broken in our society. Yeah. So what, what was it like working for, for both of those? It was like going to school in some ways. I felt like the, I was at The Onion for five years. I was at The Daily Show with Trevor for almost 10. So very different amounts of time in each. And The Onion, you know, 2007 to 2012, it was the, it was the, the Obama's rise. It was Twitter and Facebook and social media. It was the tea party. Um, <laughs> it was it was wild, and it was mostly incredibly fun. Uh, the Onion is the best job I ever had. That's like the easiest thing I can say about it. Not always the easy job, but definitely the best job I ever had. And it was a masterclass in different types of comedy, um, and and relatively anonymous. There's not a lot of people on camera in the public, so you just you get to make a lot of mistakes anonymously yeah. in that in that writing and creative team. The Daily Show was like grad school. You know, if, if, if The Onion was college, then The Daily Show was me trying to get a master's. And <laughs> it kicked my butt. I'm gonna be real with you, man, it kicked my butt. And I don't know how much you talk to Trevor, but he, I joined with him because of him. He, he offered me the job. It was a pretty beautiful coincidence through my now wife who kind of knew the director who ended up helping bring Trevor to the US and she sent him to South Africa in the first place. So we had a, a karmic connection and he gave me this odd opportunity to help bring the Daily Show into like a digital future. And I was a part of the writing, but I wasn't like a formal writer for the Daily Show. And it was, I say it was hard because he took over at a really challenging time. And when he did, I don't know how, people love Trevor now, they love the show, but in the very beginning, it wasn't so clear. No, I'm who's I'm this sure old African it. dude you know, <laughs> telling America how to be America and he inherited Jon Stewart's whole staff mm. it'd be like becoming president and getting the last president's cabinet and White House staff and so I was the only new executive with him when, when he started and I didn't know anything because I was new to the whole Daily Show and I hadn't had a job job with like health insurance in a long time before that, I had been doing my own business. So there was like rules and protocols and silos and divisions and departments. I'm like, this feels like a government, you know, <laughs> job. Which I was sort of familiar with growing up in DC, but I never thought I would like end up working in it. So there were a lot of growing pains uh, that I witnessed and, and even deeper ones that I experienced. But I, I, I got a lot out of it. I learned hey. a lot. And being able to watch something so old and so particular in how it puts its work together, start to change and be a part of some of that change. Uh, I take great pride in that, uh, even though I didn't stick around that long. <laughs> and how, how long do you actually stick around? 9.5 months. I basically it was a rebirth <laughs> experience. It was a rebirth. I'm not counting. I'm just saying. It was... <laughs> we won't tell about you count for nine and a half months. Yeah, you're not, you're not yeah. Tell, you're not gonna tell nobody that. 
I but but now, so now, now, fo- you know, following following those two, you know, stop that. You know, you 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 publish your book, How to Be Black, yeah. right? And I I, I want to point something, you know, just something out. One thing out from the um, the Huffington Post piece from 2013. Mm. You you said that you uh, if if you can remember, if you can remember, you said that you hope. Uh, to show the reader another side of a black experience by offering practical comedic advice based on your own painful lessons learned. And that if you don't have a sense of humor, this book will upset you greatly. And and I want to know personally, yeah, what did you mean by that? Because that, that stuck out and, and does that still hold today? I meant to try to tap into some of the contradictions of my own black experience um sometimes we get taught you say it loud i'm black and i'm proud right this is bad for for the longest for the longest we had that sometimes we are taught that we are monsters and subhuman beasts only capable of violence and failure and maybe us as men the only good we have to offer is big sexual organs and muscles you know we could fight we can, we can get in a ring, we can get on a court, we can do, we can use our bodies to, to, for someone else's entertainment to brutalize them. Like that's what we got going for us. And, and but people also want to pay money because we're cool. We're to be looked up to, but looked down to. You know, look up to them, look down on, on them. And within our own community, we often draw lines. Oh, you're not black enough. You're doing white things. You're talking white. You're acting white. You're not keeping it real. You're selling out. And because we have so been restricted from being able to define ourselves, we internalize some of that self-hate and some of that division. So I grew up in, in this kind of triple mode. I grew up in a, with this African name and this African-American body with a strong sense of pride. And I grew up with some of the stereotype, the, the mean streets I wasn't a part of it, but I was right next to it. You know, I never sold any drugs, but everybody right around me did. And my friends, you know, disappear because of that. And also I went to these private institutions, Harvard University, been a part of the Onion and the Daily Show. So I've experienced like the best that this country can offer. And, And it's worst. At the same time, I lost my own father to gun violence in the city in the 80s. So I know all of that, all that's black. And it's not a simple story. And the book was my attempt to wrestle with all these different pieces of it, shine a light on it. And yeah, try to make it a bit funny because this stuff can be really painful. And sometimes what helps with pain is laughter. Well, in, in, in many ways though, the, 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 the world, I would say has, has, has caught up with, with you. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, Thank and, you. you know, Thank you. With, with, with your recent calls for, uh, you know, social justice and our and just our society as a whole. Yeah. What What do you think is um is, is a key? Is is key for the progress as we move forward? There's there's a there's like a janitor's ring full of keys, Melo. There's no one key. There's a bunch of keys to open a bunch of doors. But uh, here's a couple. I think for us to keep moving forward. We, all of us, not just black people, but especially non-black people have to understand the history we come out of. And a lot of times we got shame associated with it and people get all tight and feel a certain type of way. You, you're hating America. You're trying to talk trash about my country. It's like talking about somebody's mama. You know, no, nobody talk about my mama, even though your mama's beating your butt. <laughs> you know, and we got to acknowledge that our parents actual and metaphorical aren't perfect and love them for their imperfections and know them more deeply because of that i want us to know the country deeply know the whole truth not just the highlight reels the whole game so we can learn and play better the next time that's going to be important for us to move forward otherwise we're just going to keep making these same mistakes i also think for our for us as black people an important key is remembering we're more than our suffering mm. It's a really oh, that's, hard, that's major. No, that's that's major. Right? It it feels like a contradiction to me sometimes because our suffering has been a key to not just our liberation, but the liberation of the whole country. We've been this constant reminder, this constant nudge, like yo, America, you know you could do better, right? Yo, what about the voting? What about the access to housing? 
What about service in the military? What about pollution in the rivers? Like we've been at every one of those battles. We have moved forward every one of those battles and we have been a, like a living example of what not to do and how to do things better. But I also don't want us to just constantly be in this suffering, tragedy, victim, you know, mode. It's just, it doesn't feel whole. It doesn't feel fully healthy. And I think we got to do both. I think we got to acknowledge this pain and use it to move forward, but also like make space for the joy. Uh, we got to practice being free before we're free so that we can really enjoy the freedom when we actually get it. Mm. Preach. What? Definitely preach. One, <laughs> one, one last thing before, before we switch it up. Uh, yeah. it, it, it was recently announced that, that the memoir, uh, your memoir, uh, would be adapted into a, a TV series, animated TV series. Right. Um, that Courtney, Courtney Lilly will also write and executive produce. Mm -hmm. Like how, how, like how did the show, there's a couple of questions. How did the show come about and, and why will it be an animated show versus a live action? That's yo, there's, there's hours of answers in that question. Let me try <laughs> to be quick because I want people to understand that none of this stuff happens easily. Mm -hmm. uh, the book itself almost didn't happen. You know, I, I had a deal. I wrote most of the book. The editor who brought me in got fired. A new person came in, didn't understand or see the vision. The whole thing almost fell apart. So my lawyer got involved and helped save the day, which I wasn't emotionally ready to do because I had just lost a friend to suicide. Right. These things emerge and they kind of throw you off and you got to reprioritize. So that, that's a miracle already that the book happened. The TV show, I wrote a whole script. I sold it to a network years ago. <laughs> Never saw the light of day. I got health insurance for a year. That was nice because we live in a weird country made of money, but we got to beg for health insurance and have the right exact type of job to get it. So I had the right exact type of job for like 9.5 months. And it was just something about that time frame. Um, this version of the TV show came about because Lawrence Fishburne read my book and he saw my TED talk. I did this TED talk back in 2019. Yes. white people calling the cops on black people. And he saw both those things and was like, we need to work with this brother. And his team at Cinema Gypsy had already been working into animation. They were looking for something kind of in the realm of what How to Be Black had to say. So I jumped on a call with his people, a Zoom. It was COVID times. And all of a sudden I hear Morpheus's voice. <laughs> you know? And I was like, nobody told me the Bowery King was going to show up on this call. <laughs> and I, fr I freaked out. I freaked out like you do. That's not a normal right. day for me. I mean, you might be a normal day for you. It's not a normal day for me just kicking it with Lawrence Fishman. So we had some great conversations and saw eye to eye about the potential to adapt this, this, the book into something that's animated, that's hyper real, that's satirical and playful maintain some of the tone of the book, but the book wasn't written with TV in mind. It was written as a book. And then we paired up with Courtney, uh, who's been with Blackish for a while and done a whole bunch of other stuff, way, way more TV than I have done. And we're going to anchor it, you know, in some of that, that upbringing in that Washington DC 1980s family that helped me become part of who I am. I'm so looking forward to it. I'm a little terrified because I haven't yeah. done this before. <laughs> So what 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 can what can what can you what can fans expect? What can we expect from from the show? Oh my goodness! I I hope uh, first of all you expect to just see the show. Like I said, I've been in this business a little bit, and a lot of times <laughs> these things get announced. And the announcement should add some pressure to actually yeah. make the show happen. So we put it out there. We we go manifest. Exactly. It. It's, it's coming. It's, it's, it's like it's a hostage coming. situation. You know, right. if you it's don't coming. hear from this show within two years you call somebody <laughs> like what happened to baritone show because something went terribly wrong right uh, i think you can expect to see a portrait of a city much bigger than the political capital of the u.s uh, i think you can see the multiple flavors and shades of what a black community and a brown community feels like outside of the criminality you know we've seen sold so much and talking about who we are and how we are. And, and I think you're gonna see some absurdly ridiculous comedic scenes uh, anchored in real life, but heightened animation lets us do some funky things that I'm just still wrapping my head around. Like, oh, we could just make people walk through walls? Right, because there's no rules. You could change physics in animation. Right, absolutely. Forcing me to push my imagination 
I've been so tied to this world, talking in nonfiction, writing in nonfiction, and now to be able to create a world, that's a new muscle for me. So you can expect to see something I've never done before. And you got Morpheus with you. And I got Morpheus with you. <laughs> Switch. Switch, switch, it, switch it gears a little bit. Uh, there's, there's, let's, let's talk about your podcast, How, how yes. to Citizen. Uh, the, the show is actually, you know, focused, focused on using word, using the word uh, citizen uh, as a verb and, and helping listeners learn new perspectives and practices from the actual show. The, the idea of, of citizen as a verb, how, how did that come about? Uh, that, that came in part from my dearly departed mother who, when I was way too young to hear anything like this, gave me a, a ridiculous homework assignment. Me and my sister, to be fair, was a shared burden. She, she wanted us to come up with a, the new system we live under after democracy and capitalism have failed. That's a, that's a heavy dime to drop on like an eight-year-old, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you're not, you're not comprehending that. But she's, she was right. You know, she saw something coming. So in part, it came, like, historically from that. More recently um, I was getting fed up with the news I think whether you watch television news you just scroll through social media where we get information about the world is very negative and it's very depressing and it's very disempowering we allegedly live in this system of like people power but I just hear all these stories about how other people have power and there's not much you can do Mitch McConnell's gotta agree to such and such and I, I don't control the senator from Kentucky, but what do I control? <laughs> right. And, and how could I help govern, you know, my little piece of my community with other people as, as the intention of the system is. And I knew people doing way more than just waiting for some senator to cast the right vote. Voting super important. I am not knocking it. I'm also saying a lot of people can't engage in it. You know, people with felony convictions or children, <laughs> both of whom are highly invested in this society, there's other ways to flex that power. So the show is an exploration of what else we can do. How can we wield this power? And choosing the word citizen, which has been so used to divide us, you know, deporting people, kidnapping babies from churches and sending them across the border. That's one way to do it. I don't think that's the most constructive or, or compassionate way. Citizen as a verb is like, what can we do besides scream into the pillow and punch the walls after watching TV news. That's what I was interested in. And I knew enough to know a bunch of people doing more than just screaming. You got people like Jose Andres with the World Central Kitchen out here running toward the floods, running toward yes. the, the earthquakes yes. to feed people. You got folks like Desmond Mead down in Florida getting formerly incarcerated folks registered to vote, overturning laws that were making that illegal. You got Magnolia Mother's Trust, Aishi Andoro down in the Southeast, just giving people money, mostly single black women who have been told so much by the government exactly where to put your foot, where to put your money, how to live your life, which is the opposite of all this freedom we're supposed to be enjoying here in the land of the free. So all those stories, that made me feel better. Wow. So the podcast is, you know, shining a light on those folks and, and on our audience and giving them things to do besides complain. Now, the, 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 the four pillars, I want to get this right, of, of oh, being yeah. a citizen per, per the website. Uh, to participate, uh, to invest in relationships, uh, to understand our power, and to, to value the collective. Uh, those, are, those are four powerful uh, pillars. Yeah. How, 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 are, how are they decided? How are those pillars decided? Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of history. That's a big creative session with my wife, Elizabeth. She, I'll give her a lot of credit on this. I have been, <laughs> there's a consistent theme here. I've been trying to make this show around citizen as a verb for almost five years now. I made two television pilots. You know, there's a lot of stories of like failure coming up in this interview too. Um, and when we adapted, when I was adapting it to what it would be as a podcast, my wife pulled me aside. She's like, what do you, what do you mean by this? Like, what does the show believe it means we got to have a point of view. If we're going to be teaching people something, we got to have some kind of core values around those teachings. I was like, that's, 
You're absolutely correct. I'm slightly annoyed, but you're right. <laughs> <laughs> she was forced me to step up the game. And so we together came up with these, with our early guests, you know, the idea of showing up and participating. I mean, look, you've been in the sports world for a long time. You know, you can't win a game if you don't show up. Absolutely it's, not. It's the basics. And, and a lot of us have been taught not to show up or been prevented from showing up. So, so there's that, the investing in relationships with ourselves, with others and with the planet around us, because we can't do any of this alone. And a lot of the way we set up the economy, a lot of the way this technology works, it separates us from ourselves. It separates us from each other. So we're all out here feeling alone like little islands. When we come together, we have more power. And then the understanding power one, that Eric Liu, Citizen University, specific shout out, because he talks about power as something we shouldn't be ashamed of. It's just the ability to get somebody to do what you want them to do. How, what ways do we have to tap into that? There's voting, there's money, there's gathering in crowds, there's yelling real loud in the streets, there's sharing ideas. There's so many ways to do that. And then this last one, this idea of the collective, is because in the, in the U.S. especially, Mello, we get this big um, propaganda about individualism. It's a, it's a double-edged sword. A lot of people come to this country to be individuals because they're tired of being beholden to some collective. I respect that. But also, when we overdo it, then we all suffer. You know, right. I can't come up with a vaccine by myself. I need teams. You know, I need a collective. And if I'm working to keep a community safe, that community is safer. If my wife gets paid adequately, our household makes more money. So it doesn't have to be this zero-sum game if we see ourselves as a part of the collective. So all that philosophizing, that was important to set some ground rules and it helps us decide what guests to bring on, um, helps us kind of reorient over and over again, and just repeat that. And none of that is talking about a party affiliation. None of that is talking about formal electoral politics. That can be a piece of the puzzle, but that can work inside your church. That could work inside your sports team. That could work inside your household, your classroom, your block. Those things apply at every scale of our of our existence together. Bring, bring, bring it all back uh, to what's in your glass. Uh, I have a few uh, quick fire questions for us to close out. Uh, and I, I, myself and, and, and the people, uh, we always want to know what's in your glass on special occasion. Uh, doesn't have to be, I always tell people, doesn't have to be any label specifically. Yeah. But uh, what's, what's, what's your go-to when, uh, when you're on a vacation? What's your go-to? Send your glass. My go-to, so I'm a whiskey person um, and I'm a mezcal person. The old-fashioned okay. is my go-to drink. And okay, smoky. I, you like smoky. I like smoky. I like um, the simplicity of an old-fashioned, though, too. It's weird. It's a simple drink that you can mess up very easily. <laughs> Uh, as I have found from ordering it uh, across the country and the world. But there's a, there's a whiskey, uh, Uncle Nearest. Oh, yeah, for sure. I Absolutely. I learned about within the past year. It was a pandemic discovery. And Nearest Green, who taught Johnny, uh, Jack Daniels, everything he knew about distilling whiskey, uh, an enslaved man at the time. That's some very good whiskey. And I like an old-fashioned with that. Or I'll flip it, make an old-fashioned out of some mezcal. And sometimes it hits my body more easily, mezcal, <laughs> uh, in terms of what I feel like the next day if I want to have a few. <laughs> so celebrating with a mezcal old fashioned or super special occasions, I'll take the heat from the uh, from the uncle nearest. What about you? What's your special go to? You know, I'm a I'm a aside from wine, I'm a I'm a bourbon guy. Mm. I'm a big time I'm a big time bourbon guy. Yeah. Um, that that's that's what that's my drink of choice. All right. Uh, I, I, I like old, I like old fashions, uh, but I, I'd rather just get my my bourbon on 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 one rock, two rock, or one, oh, one big rock. Oh, sip it, okay. Yeah, you gotta sip, 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 sip the bourbon. So you're so um, you're drinking good bourbon when you do that, right? Yeah, I'm drinking. No, listen, I've learned a long time ago. If you're gonna drink, drink the best. <laughs> it's simple. Drink the best. Deal deal with it. Deal with it later. <laughs> I'd rather deal with the I'd, I'd rather deal with the aftermath of dealing with the best than not. Yeah, agreed. I like uh, that. I like that philosophy. So what what's 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 in your glass when you when you're out to let's say a, a nice restaurant? Mm. A nice restaurant, it just makes me think of wine. And I don't have like a wine that I always go to. It just depends. 
my relationship with wine is tricky because I I feel like I used to feel about art. Like I just don't know enough to have a strong opinion. But as I learn over time, I like wine that is earthy, that's full, and that's got a little spice to it. You give me some like pepper, some cloves in a, in a nice full red wine. I don't know if that's a Merlot or a Cabernet or a Pinot Noir. I, I can't keep that straight all the time. But I know I like those flavors and that feeling. And if I'm going to have like a nice, you know, talk about nice, get a nice steak, hit me with a glass of that spicy red, and I'll be, I'll be in heaven for a while. Well, you know what you like. And that, that's, that's all. It's just like art. You know, yeah. not, not, not everybody's going to like the same art. It's, it's yeah. to, you know, each his own and personal preference. So you're, 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 celebrating, uh, you're celebrating how to be black and become a New York Times bestseller. Hmm. <laughs> what did I probably had a lot of old? I probably just had a lot of like straight up whiskey without any mixing when that bestseller thing happened. Uh, but retroactively, you know what? Let's pop champagne for that. Okay. okay. Let's pop champagne for that. A, a good friend of mine, she is a champagne connoisseur, and she has elevated my game to to find champagne that's not too sweet, like the driest champagne possible, as iced okay. as possible. I love that. And that's a really good celebratory, some bubbles for the party. Oh, she taught you well. She, she, she's giving you a hell of an experience. So thank her. Yeah. Uh, you know, Matt Baratun, I just want to say thank you, man. You know, I, honestly, I enjoyed this conversation that we had. Uh, I enjoyed listening to you speak. Um, you know, good, good luck with, with, with your show, with your podcast, mm. um, just your, your, your future endeavors and everything you have going on. Keep being the voice that we all need. Uh, for our community, but as a, as a society, as a whole, we, we, we need more voices like, like yourself. Um, so, you know, best of luck, best of luck with everything that you have going on right now. Uh, thank you to the audience for tuning in this week. Uh, as you all know, please follow, rate, review, what's in your glass on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, wherever you listen to your podcast at. And you can also check out the videos uh, released each week on YouTube. Uh, there we have it. I appreciate it. And I, can I express some gratitude right here real quick? Absolutely. I know you have your, your exit flow. I don't want to break it too too much. First of all, I'll, I second your thanks to anybody listening to or watching this. Thanks for your time and attention. You can find me, Baratunde, everywhere. Baratunde is a found on social media. It's all me. And to you, Carmelo, you are very good at this. And I knew you were very good at balling. Like, <laughs> it's literally your profession. So that is not surprising. But to see this shift... I'm, if you're coming from my industry. You're coming from my job now. So I'm you know, a, little, a, little, a little upset, <laughs> but mostly I'm very, uh, I'm very impressed and I'm grateful. So thank you for sharing your stage with me and this other gift that you have that I had no idea about. Keep it up. Keep growing. Yeah, absolutely. Keep your thing. It's, it's, you have many things that you have to offer, and it's nice to see you doing this one. I appreciate you. I, I'm sure I'll see you down the road, and I'll be supporting you for sure. This feeling is mutual. Feeling is mutual. Indeed. Thanks, my brother. All right. Peace. Peace.